Hey guys, we're live. We already have about 30 viewers and we've just been live oh. for like 10 seconds. So that's Boy. a good start. Okay. I feel sorry for them. So that's right. So <laughs> hello to my friends. Thanks for joining uh, us this evening. To those of you on Facebook, thanks for tuning in. Um, we're going to start just by going around the room. We have 11 people here who teach uh, trumpet uh, at, uh, at various universities uh, in Kentucky. And so we'll just kind of go around the, the room here, around the screen and introduce each of us. Uh, my name is Jason Doval, and I'm the trumpet teacher at the University of Kentucky. I'm Joe Van Fleet. I teach at Eastern Kentucky University. I was Joey, Greg Wing, Moorhead State University, and Moorhead, Kentucky. George Carpton IV. I'm at Northern Kentucky University. <laughs> Who's next? Vince DiMartino, <laughs> retired, <laughs> formerly at University of Kentucky and Center College. I'm Sarah, I'm Sarah Herbert, and I will be at Western Kentucky University starting this fall. Oh, good for you. Yeah. Hilltoppers. Welcome, Sarah. Welcome to Kentucky. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah, well, we'll steer you down the right way. <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll go next. I'm Eric Swisher. I'm out at Murray State. Yes. I'm, I'm a, I'll oh, go next. I'm Stacy Simpson. I'm at Bellarmine University in Louisville, Kentucky. Okay. And since we're um, in Louisville, I'm, I'm Reese Land, and I'm in the University of Louisville. I'm Marlon McKay. I'm at Kentucky State University in the capital of Frankfort, Kentucky. And I'm uh, Jeff Barrington. I teach at Campbellsville University and at uh, Asbury University. Good. Awesome. Great. I think that was everyone, right? So yep. uh, we have some folks that, uh, I, well, the next question is just, what were you doing before you came to Kentucky or before you assumed your, your current position? Uh, myself, I moved here from the thriving metropolis of Tahlequah, Oklahoma, uh, in the, the the heart of the, the capital of the Cherokee Indian Nation, where I was the trumpet professor at Northeastern State University. I was in Las Vegas, Nevada for 21 years. I'm very fortunate to have a career out there. I was in the middle of my doctorate at North Texas, uh, playing and teaching in Dallas as well. I was finishing my uh, DMA at CCM and uh, went right across the river to Northern Kentucky. <laughs> yes. I taught a bunch of uh, private lessons in the Lexington area and um, played in the orchestra in Lexington and also taught at Campbellsville for just a little bit uh, right before EKU and uh, I really loved the Campbellsville. Very, very nice place. Hey Marlon. I taught at Indiana University in Bloomington, Indiana. Uh, several courses uh, that the late Dr. David Baker taught in the Music and General Studies program. All right. Go go Hoosiers. I also went to IU uh, <laughs> undergrad. <laughs> and um, But right now I'm uh, in Laramie, Wyoming, finishing up a visiting, uh, visiting year teaching here uh, as a visiting professor. And then I'll be, uh, and before that, I was at CCM. Uh, also finishing my doctorate. That's right. That's right. Who's next? Well, I'll go. I um, was uh, a music director for the Salvation Army for about 12 years in Texas and New Jersey. Uh, and then uh, most recently went back to school, went to get my DMA at the University of Kentucky with uh, Jason Doval. Uh, I guess I'll go next. Um, <clears throat> I have been everywhere. I don't know what to say. Um, <laughs> playing, playing professionally for 25, 30 years. I don't know what the Louisville Orchestra off and on is part time, whatever. And I've taught, um, taught at some colleges in Ohio, uh, also at Campbellsville for a year. And um, I guess uh, St. Louis Symphony for a year. And then I've been back in Louisville since uh, 2004, I guess. And I've been doing some freelancing, playing at Derby Dinner Playhouse, doing all kinds of playing, and then got the job at Bellarmine uh, in 2013, which I've been um, play, uh, been there for that long since now. What? I don't know oh, wow. what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> Where have I been? I don't know. How do you say it? <laughs> well, and 
I guess I'm next. I taught at uh, Campbellsville for eight years before this job. So I guess we've all kind of been there, huh? <laughs> Campbellsville, um, really, yeah. Yeah, and I drove from uh, Louisville there f uh, five days a week for eight years. So I put uh, over 300,000 miles in my car, which finally just died about a month ago. And uh, anyway, uh, so before that, I was at the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg for one year, and that was one of my first jobs. So anyway, that's me. Am I the only one left? I think so, Vince. Well, I'm Vince DiMartino, and I came here in 1972, which is probably just about almost 50 years ago. And I've enjoyed my time here teaching at University of Kentucky and teaching at Center College. And uh, I've enjoyed actually just following what's going on at all the universities in Kentucky, which is some pretty remarkable things. A lot of, a lot of wonderful young people have gone to school here in Kentucky and, and I'm glad to have spent most of my professional career here in Kentucky. Great. So uh, since we're talking about Kentucky and sort of Kentucky trumpet history, I have a few photos. I'm gonna share my screen oh. here. Uh -oh. um, this uh. first photo, uh, I don't know the exact date. Can you guys all see that photo now? <laughs> yep. Can everyone oh, see the photo? Terry. Terry 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 Martino, then. So this is uh, probably the last time, the last time Kentucky Trumper professors got together for something like this, I guess. It was somewhere between 1994 and 1998 because the mm -hmm. person here in the front is Terry Everson, who was the trumpet teacher at UK from 94 yeah. to 98. So oh, there's wow. Terry. And there's Vince DiMartino, who at that time was at Center College. Look at all that dark black hair there. Yeah. And then over here was the trumpet professor at Eastern Kentucky University. That's Kevin Eisensmith. Kevin Eisensmith, yeah. Yeah, yeah. He, he is now at um, University of Indiana, Pennsylvania. And uh, Terry Everson sent me this picture. He said it was a fundraiser you guys got together yeah. and did for WEKU. It was the, uh, actually, it was great because... Uh, it started at eight o'clock at night and went till eight o'clock the next morning. Oh wow! And uh, and we and they they were they never raised any money at night, and uh, so I said, well, why don't why don't we go on? We can't do any worse than they're doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so Terry Terry was actually it was pretty amazing. That's uh, John Francis, the guy with the beard. He was actually working at the station time. He's a fine trumpet player, and he was one of Rich Hillman's students who was teaching trumpet there at the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, cool. so Terry, you know, would, he had he brought a keyboard along and all the things that he played, he would just play with the MIDI. Wow. And, and all the things that that we played, he would play our piano parts. We just bring our piano parts and he sat down and read like Halsey Stevens, you know, <laughs> anything. He could just sit down and play it. I mean, it was yeah. pretty remarkable. He's a and, fabulous uh, piano player. Oh, yeah. And there's uh, Bill Jones there too. And he's actually making trumpets now. He taught at uh, Appalachian State for a while. Wow. And uh, Kevin, he used to get mad at me because I'd say, uh, if somebody calls in with $50, Kevin Eisensmith is going to play the opening to Mahler 5. He goes, no, I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> but you are. Somebody call in with $50. And if not, I'm going to give you $50. He says, I'm not doing that. <laughs> And, you know, and then by the time it got to be three in the morning, you'd find me like stretched out on the floor. I was completely dead. <laughs> Horizontal. <laughs> you know, but we had a great time. It was a wonderful, it was a wonderful experience where we'd all get together. And actually, they bring in free pizzas and food and everything from the local uh, establishments. And it, it was very nice. It was, oh, cool. It was a good, good time. Nice. The next photo I have here uh, has uh, oh, yeah. right in front here is Joe Van Fleet. Joe Van Fleet. Uh, that's Joe. Rich. That's Rich. <laughs> and uh, Rich Illman, who is a former uh, EKU trumpet professor, now emeritus from Michigan State. I'm hiding all the way down here on the on far the right. right. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, some of Joe's highly successful students are hiding behind here. Yeah. Uh, uh, some EKU students uh, back there. This picture is really important to me because uh, this was the event. This is in uh, Calavrita, Greece in January 2013. And that's where I met Joe. But it's also important to me because that's the event where Vince talked me into applying for the University of Kentucky job. And uh, three months later, I was I was packing my bags for Kentucky, so that's pretty cool. Wow. Here's one more picture, and this is uh, this one's for George and Sarah. 
uh, my second my second year at, at in Kentucky. This is from September two thousand fourteen. My second year, I went up to NKU and played a recital. That's and right. for whatever reason, to this day, I don't know why you guys came, but it was cool that you came. <laughs> yeah. Two Cincinnati <laughs> students right here, George and Sarah, for yep. whatever reason, they heard, out of, they heard about this concert and they came and they got in a picture and took a picture. And little did they know that a few years later, they would be moving to Kentucky and be joining us here yeah. in Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah. So this would have been a uh, you know, full circle. Full I know. Yeah. It's so, very true. So that Rachel was, Rodriguez is here on the yep. far left. She was yeah. teaching at NKU in the time. And there's, there's That's George great. and, and there's Sarah. So uh, Sarah. I, I, dug wow. I dug that one. I dug that one up. So wow. those are, I, if we get bored, I, I have a few more uh, Kentucky history <laughs> photos. If we get bored, if I just oh. want to share those one. So these next couple of questions, you can just give like a one word or a yes or no question. Uh, just, you know, just curious to see our general approach to some basic things. Um, uh, first question, do you have a regular routine that you do every day on the trumpet? For me, it's yes, I do. Yes. 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 Uh -oh. <laughs> Are there any no's? Yes. Just for curiosity, any no's? <laughs> yeah. That's great. So for my students who are watching, notice the unanimous yeses among all university <laughs> professors here in Kentucky. Mm -hmm. uh, number two, what is the first note you play every day? If it's the same note every day, uh, what is your first note? For me, yes, it's the same note. And it's Ooh. second line G. Second line G. Same here. Me too. Me too. It's a good note. <laughs> <laughs> it's supposed to be a good note. It's good note. It's the only one that's good. <laughs> Does anyone start on something other than a second line G? I, I go uh, second line G, but only after I buzz lead pipe for yeah, right. same wow. here. That's what yeah. I was gonna say. I, I, was gonna I say, add the, the lead pipe. I don't think the first thing note I, I play in the day can be considered a real note. It's the lead pipe. <laughs> <laughs> I just love it because it just gets everything moving. And right. that's, a contra, about it. That's, a, that's a contra D flat, if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> Roughly. <laughs> yeah. So what do you guys prefer? Do you consider yourself to be a, you prefer B flat trumpet, C trumpet, or some other instrument? What is, if you had to pick one instrument that you like to play the most? Stacy, you know? what's my answer? Uh, e flat trumpet, baby. All <laughs> <laughs> hey, but, but how was that Stravinsky on C trumpet? Yeah, that's right. Stravinsky went pretty well. It sucked too bad. It did. I was in the audience for that. <laughs> I, played, I played all of my classical rep on B flat in college. That's the Stravinsky Firebird, Dvorak New World, Ooh. Diaz Meditation, all on B flat, just transposed. Wow. Nice. Good for you. <laughs> You know, when I was in when I was in college, I would probably said C trumpet, but after teaching uh, for a, a while now, it's probably B flat. I I warm up on the B flat. Yeah, and I I do. It depends on what music I'm playing. When I was in college, I played C trumpet a lot in performances for classical music because it was like turning a switch for me. When I put that mouthpiece and that horn up. My whole mind was in that in that landscape, you know. And sure. when I played my B flat, or I played B flat in quintet a lot, you know, <laughs> almost all the time actually. But but you know, for me, I, I had the sound set up on my C trumpet for strictly for playing like you know traditional music and etudes and warm, you know. And then my my B flat trumpet was sort of my jazz trumpet, or it was my brass quintet trumpet, you know. So <laughs> I, I I did that a lot. Just but it. I don't know. I could have probably done it, you know, both on B flat. But I've never comments? seen a C trumpet. When I went to <laughs> school, when I went to school, I asked, I asked one of my friends. I said, "Hey, Paul, how come your tuning slides cut off?" <laughs> <laughs> I had never seen. I had never seen a C trumpet. I just thought it meant you play up a step. That's all I knew. <laughs> so you know, it just. <laughs> I didn't even know what a C trumpet was until I was at least 22. That's what I'm saying. I got to Eastman and I found people playing these weird horns. You know <laughs> Anyone else want to chime in about instruments? Anyone prefer to warm up on piccolo or something like that? <laughs> you know, I'll warm You'll probably oh, catch me 90% of the time playing if you see me anywhere, though, on flugelhorn, to be honest with you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
You're the master of that, brother. Amen. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> I warm up on piccolo when I'm playing the Brandenburg or any of those really hard pieces. Mm -hmm. I have this strange little warm up I do. I really don't want to play too much. So I, I play like, I have this like tritone warm up I do, starting on low F sharp. And I just play F sharp, C, F sharp, C, F sharp, you know, like that. And I just go up. And when I reach the magic notes that I need, time to play. <laughs> you know, and and, uh, and I've already done my last Brandenburg. It was about six or seven years ago. <laughs> And I'm, I'm I'm about to give my original handwritten uh, part to my son Gabriel, so he can keep it forever, and I don't ever have to see it. Again. <laughs> so uh, let's go. Pass from, the torch. Let's go from gear to players. Who's your favorite trumpet player? Well, I, I grew up with Al Hurt and Harry James. Yeah, well, that's, that's great. Persif and Andre. Uh, Miles Always Davis. been a Phil Smith guy. Yeah. Mm. yeah. Phil Smith. Miles, yeah. Miles Davis and Wynton Marcellus. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, I agree with Eric Swisher, but I believe that those uh, Hokon Hardenberger recordings that are coming out yeah. this week oh, yeah. are amazing. No doubt. Those are, yeah, those are, I have to say, um, Ray Mace was always my favorite. And then uh, Nicholas Payton and Tom Harrell, those two together. Yeah. Great Mace. Wow, what a player. Yeah. He's a bad dude. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As far as someone who's my hero who can sort of do anything, whether it be uh, play jazz or classical or improvise or lead trumpet or, or chamber music, that would have to be Vince DiMartino as well. Uh, oh, for sure. I must mention him <laughs> among, among the all-time greats. Uh, yeah. Who is sure. that? Who is that? Good. <laughs> it's the right answer. Um, well, for me, you know, for me, it's it's kind of funny. I, I tend to just vacillate. I just, I kind of zone in on people. You know what I mean? And I try to get into their, the, the musical, the uh, emotional presentation that they do. And, and I try to stay with people. I used to do that when I was younger, especially because I had no idea of what was going on anyway. So I would just zone in on people and, and uh, especially people, I didn't really understand what they were playing. You know, sometimes if it was a, you know, a contemporary player and I was going, what's, what is this all about? You know, I don't, I didn't really, and then, you know, I, I just listened to that until it started to, there's my wife, Patty. Uh, uh, I'd listen until I started to make sense to me. You know, I could, I could figure out how I would play this piece or how I would play in that style or how I'd play in that orchestra or that jazz band or, you know. So for me, it was sort of a study of landscapes and then how these wonderful, marvelous trumpet musicians fit themselves into this, you know, mass of people in some cases or or just a solo you know thing with a piano or organ or a small group or something like that and i think that helped me more than anything because it allowed me to be to, to uh to be flexible i didn't get you know and then i heard of course I, when i went to eastman i started hearing all these players i mean it was unbelievable you know when you when you sit in the orchestra and and uh, you know you look at your part and the Kofi F Fifth Symphony is up, and you're sitting there and go, "Man, I got nothing in this. I was playing second trumpet." And all of a sudden, you hear, and Phil Collins is playing next to me, and I start getting the chills. You know, <laughs> I knew something was happening. You know, yeah, and I think that's that's really uh, that's another reason students and everyone should attend live concerts. concerts. That doesn't happen as much on a recording, no matter how good the playing is. It's two dimensional. The three dimensional playing, where when I was sat next to him and heard that, I went, Whoa, I never heard anything like that. I never sat next to anybody like that. He was a professional trumpet player when he came as a, prof as a freshman. Mm -hmm. I mean, he sounded like, you know, just like he'd make, been making recordings for 20 years and he was 18 years old. And, you know, and I sat next to quite a few people like that. Marvin Perry, he was in the same class with me and he played first in Indianapolis. It's really funny because we all ended up within uh, 150 miles of one another. But, uh, you know, it, it, being next to uh, having colleagues that are constantly educating you. Besides, you know, uh, I think I heard Maurice Andre's very first concert. It was at Ithaca College in 1970. Uh, and he played there. and. Uh, 
it was just the most amazing concert I ever had been to. Because, I mean, that was his very first concert in America, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he went out and he finished the tour, was in Town Hall, New York, it was the last concert. But that very first concert, wow. And I heard Ed Tarr at, at Fredonia, mm -hmm. and I heard Hakan Hardenberger at University of Chicago. And, uh, you know, all these iconic kinds. Mel Broyles coming out in a pink sweater with jeans on, playing Horace Staccato on his E-flat trumpet. You had to have been there to see that. Yeah. Hey, you Vincent. Know? Yeah. Vince, if that's your one word answer, we're in trouble when we go to the long yeah. essay. <laughs> yeah, I can't help it. <laughs> no, I, I think about this, this whole, whole, you know, genre of, of sound. There's not any one sound, you know, except the beauty of each person. The beauty of each person, you know. Just... Well, the next question is, uh, uh, just pick one. If you were stranded on a desert island, it can only take one trumpet book. What would that book be? What's your favorite trumpet book? Oh, wow. Charlie A for me. What's yeah. that, Greg? Charlie A. Oh, Charlie yeah. A, great. Mm. Yeah. I'll, I'll agree with that. You can't go wrong there. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Hard, hard not to have your Arben book. Yeah, hard not to have your Arben. I've got to memorize. I still prefer, <laughs> I still prefer the St. Jacome, to be honest. Oh, that's wow. a mean book. Mm -hmm. Once I got into the St. Jacome, I really kind of realized that I like the, uh, the way the A2s are written and mm -hmm. a little more than the Arbens. But Arbens is classic, but I would pick St. Jacome, honestly. So I'd say Arben, but I'm going to do a shift and go with the French Arben, the three mm. volume Leduc version. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That one. <laughs> those three, those three books are. Yep. But you only get to take one. Ah, that's right. I'll, I'll, I'll go to Kinko's and put them all together. <laughs> I always tell students my thing, my deserted island book is the Marco Bordoni vocalises. Oh yeah, uh, especially the Roshu trombone version of it. I just love playing those, and um, they're so beautiful and such a great way of working on phrasing and all those sorts of things. So, yeah. Mine is the Aaron Harris studies. Man. Because they're debilitating. I like, yes. I like being embarrassed. Yes. Well, I love uh, public embarrassment. So uh, uh, when I heard Al Vizzuti used to play out of that book, and I, and, well, we, we were students together. And that's, and so we, you know, I started to learn those. I said, yeah, I can see why these are. <laughs> I love the Charlie A book, but I also love the Top Tones book a lot. Mm -hmm. I played out of that book yeah. quite a bit. Yeah. I'd say like, quite a few challenges in that book uh, as yeah. well. I'd probably take the um, the second trumpet uh, compilation part to the Charlet so I can play some uh, duets with uh, Mr. Wing. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Now you're cooking. I would say mine mine would be the Peach book. I love the Peach. Mm. That's a good book. Yes, Peach book. Yeah, yes. twenty two eight twos. Yep. Mm -hmm. He's got a couple more too. Q Press just put out a bunch of. Them. Yeah. Yeah. They put out the big book, the one called The Trumpet. The yeah, trumpet, I've got, yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, The Trumpet. Yeah, I haven't okay. seen that. I got to check that out. Yeah, that's there's some, you know, there's some really interesting pieces in there that are we haven't mm. found the piano parts to. Mm. Uh, Stolberg mm. and the other one is uh, something else, and they're themes and variations from the mid 1800s. Mm. And I've been looking for the piano parts for those, but I haven't found them yet. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Any other books? That's oh, great. Good books. studies. I played out of that a lot when I was younger. I'm not sure if you know that it's a an A2, all the major and minor keys. Oh, the Sigmund Hearing? Hearing. Hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, I, oh, yeah, the Hearing I, books. That's in my syllabus. Mm hmm. Longinati? And a lot of us have your syllabus, mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, Vince, a funny story. I don't think yeah. I've told you this. When I got my first job in Oklahoma, um, the place was mostly kind of cleaned out, but there were a few things left behind by the previous teacher. And one of the things said, Vince Martino trumpet syllabus. That was just there, you know? Oh, wow. And it was just kind of, it was, there it was. That's you know? how old I am. He, I he probably said it, it didn't work. It said it didn't work, so he left. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I can't speak for everybody, but I bet if we had a show of hands that who uses Vince DiMartino's curriculum. <laughs> There'll be a lot of hands going up. That's <laughs> it's, it's useful. You know, it's not what's in the box. It's it's not what's in the boxes. It's doing the boxes. <laughs> yeah. Having two weeks assignments and saying, okay, you get a grade, you're done. Yeah. Let's go on to week three and four now. Ooh. And uh, discipline training is really what the syllabus is all about for me. It is. 
and it, and it also makes sure that everybody goes through uh, a really uh, remedial course of trumpet. You find out everything that a student can do or can't do, and then you know how they. Eric has a really really nice book that I still have that he let me look at, but I, I sneak peeks in it. <laughs> and and uh, you know, and everybody has a, a similar approach. I did a whole sabbatical on that. Uh, and uh, I wasn't really popular at home because the living room was a, one of those big open rooms and I had every book of every type piled on top of one another, you know, oh, wow. so I could set up the syllabus so I could pick out etudes that were in the right keys for the right week. So mm. that lasted for about a month and a half. <laughs> so that, that really wasn't popular. But I had to pick it up every once in a while because I'm a vacuum cleaner. <laughs> anyway. Great. So the next uh, couple of questions here, we can uh, go into more detail if oh. necessary, if necessary uh, events. Oh. <laughs> uh, so, so since all of our gigs are canceled right now, what are you practicing and what advice do you have for other trumpet players who are struggling to find motivation or direction right now that we're all kind of quarantined with nothing to practice for? Oh my God, let me start. Well I, mean, well, I mean, I mean, I teach four and five hour lessons a day, so we're still in school for the final final week, and I play with all my students, and I play two hours before I begin. But uh, I believe motivation is within. I think a good teacher has to bring out the best of the students, and I don't put up with too much of their whiny crybaby stuff. You're either going to do it or you're not going to do it. But my job is to is to kind of teach them along the way of why we're going through what we're going through, why it's important to set up a schedule and stick to it, why it's very, very important to wake up early. And, and we call it this thing, fire it up, get up and get out of bed and practice. It's amazing what a couple of hours of trumpet playing will do to your attitude. So those are some of the things that I do, and I'm I'm very anxious to hear what others do. Thank you. I've been telling my students that this is a perfect opportunity to work on some of those idiosyncrasies that everyone has in their own playing that they know are there and they don't always have the time to work out because they've got three concerts this week and a jury and XYZ. And so, okay, let's identify two or three things that by God, you want to get out of your playing. Mm -hmm. And let's see if we can zero in on, on this while we've got some time and we don't have all of the kind of requirements of the academic calendar breathing down our neck. And I've had some students that have really been successful with that in the last couple of weeks that are starting to turn the corner on some of these things that they've been chipping away at slowly for the last couple of semesters. And now some stuff is really starting to put together. So I'm trying to convince them, look, this is a golden opportunity. Let's not squander this and just try to slam through as much literature as we can possibly do. Let's find those two or three things that you really want to get out of your playing. Anyone else? Well, I'll say a few things. It, where where I'm at, my students are uh, we're we're fighting through still trying to do juries, and so we're gonna they're gonna submit those as recordings. So that's gonna be interesting. But um, one of the things that's been really beneficial and motivating has been encouraging students to uh, to record themselves a lot. So they'll be recording like a specific assignment for me in lessons, uh, which has been really helpful, especially for students uh, who have been don't have a great internet connection or you know things like that so they've been submitting recordings and then we both listen to them and uh and critique that way um and i've found that you know getting better at, at recording themselves has been really really good um and preparing for recording juries and making it um you know learning as much as you can from the benefits of recording yourself in, in your practice so well Let's see, for me, I don't think my methodology has changed very much, but the subject matter has. Um, as you know, I've been doing this a while. So for me, I'm not really teaching as many people. I'm doing seminars at different universities with this, you know, distance learning thing. But, but for me, I, you know, I, I think I'm more curious about learning the trumpet throughout my whole career. And now I'm 71. And I'm trying to maintain a professional level of trumpet playing, which is challenging. It's mm -hmm. very challenging, you know, but it's also exciting. 
because I'm learning things about my plant. I never had to work on breathing. Not really. I did, but I, I got by with not doing that. And then I never really had to work on, in, you know, endurance and stuff and being really super efficient because I don't know, I just sort of did things. But now it's really exciting because actually in a lot of ways I'm playing better than I've ever played because I'm paying attention to all those small things like Eric was talking about with his students. I'm paying attention to all these things. And I, and I have a better perspective on what to do. So I'm being like my own guinea pig and I'm trying out all these things. And a lot of them are, are really helpful. You know, I'm playing a lot. I can play lower than I've ever played with a good sound. I can play pedal notes, real pedal notes that are in tune in the right place. And it's possible. And I didn't know, you know I couldn't play a pedal note to save my life. Mm -hmm. And, and, you know, and actually high notes are better. They sound more like all the notes sound the same. So I can't do it as long, you know, because that's a, it's becoming a, a little more physically challenging to do that. But it's, it's made me a better teacher because I've addressed maybe some of the things myself that I, I just didn't do as well, you know? Great. Awesome. Go ahead, George. Yeah, um, since, the um, stay at home order has happened. Um, I found that as a teacher, um, I've had more time to actually like listen to um, music again. Um, I, you know, it's, I, when I'm teaching, you know, and you're going through your day to day routine versus when you were in school, you got, you, when I was in school, I'm sure when all of us were in school, we got to listen, go to school library and just listen to CDs all the time, listen to different recordings of um, symphonies or jazz recordings or whatever but since i've been teaching it's i don't get that time as as much but now that that has kind of um now that i'm not in school or not teaching um it's been nice to actually put on a, 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 a album and just listen to it and like, wow okay this is nice let's see what else i can uh check out i mean um, new york philharmonic is putting out some live concerts and it's been nice to just be able to listen to those and not have to worry about oh i need to go to bed now because uh i gotta get up at seven you know, to get to get to campus. So it's been it's been nice to be able to do that. So, yeah. Stacey? Yeah, well, I would say, you know, at the beginning of this quarantine, I know it was really difficult for me um, just figuring out what in the world am I going to do with all this time? That was, I, I would think, you know, that you would, you would have all this time and just be like, oh, I just want to play trumpet. But, you know, in the beginning, I was kind of perplexed as to what was going to go on. So it took some time for me to develop, and I'm sure some students as well, because when I talk with my students, they're all stressed, about, stressed out about the online courses and how mm -hmm. crazy it is uh, for them. They're feeling like they're getting more busy work. And so, you know, and so through that, it helped me to actually jump on board and, and get re-motivated because, you know, I'm, I'm basically playing, um, you know, more than I teach, I play every every week and perform. And so, without those performances and that 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 schedule that of rehearsals and and performances and engagements and you know, night after night of performing eight shows a week, you know, it, it was really difficult to figure out. Huh, I got all this time now, <laughs> and uh, and so you know, I was able to figure out some some things for me. Uh, something I've gotten into is electronic trumpet uh, with guitar pedals, things that are not comfortable for me. Um, maybe improvisation is something that I, I finally <laughs> put, did this cowboy thing with uh, a friend of mine, Brian Heath, and uh, I improvised my first solo just last week or this week, I can't remember, <laughs> you know, and put it on, on record as far as like everyone can hear it. So, you know, those type things where I'm uncomfortable, I'm kind of sticking myself out there a little bit. And as well as I've, I've found some avenues um, for uh, a recital series that is is going on in Louisville, and uh, and so I've got a recital that I'm record that I'm recording on Saturday. It'll broadcast the next next week. Um, I believe it's through the Archdiocese of Louisville. But you know, those are the type of things that even though we're quarantined, we can still find outlets to perform and to collaborate with other people. And you're seeing it all over the internet now. And I think that's really important is that if you don't feel like doing it, just call somebody up and collaborate with them and get them involved because we all need the extra push uh, at times. And so this is a great way to do it. Yeah. Great. 
You know, for the students who are watching, one of the first questions I asked was, do you have a routine? And all these 11 professors said, yes, I do. And I think you could take, I, I tell my students that, you know, our, our dedication to Trumpet can help us in other areas of our life. And one of the things I've tried to do every day of, of this quarantine is not just to have a Trumpet routine, but like a life routine where I wake up, I take a shower, I eat breakfast, I warm up on Trumpet. And once I have like sort of those fundamental things done, like, then I can do what I want. I can listen to music. I can go outside with my kids and play basketball. Like there's, there's this flexibility. Um, I just think, you know, as if you've been following on social media, things that people say about mental health and surviving quarantine and isolation, um, a routine, setting an alarm, those sorts of things are just very, very important. And they're also helpful for getting better at trumpet. Another thing I, a piece of advice I would share with students is the importance of connecting with others. For me, one of the reasons I went to get all of us together was to connect with you guys, to see some faces and, uh, to have a conversation with other humans. It's, it's uplifting to my soul. It's great to see you guys. But I, I encourage, you know, t uh, students, reach out to your professors, family, maybe grandparents you don't talk to very often, like give them a call, you know, and reach out to them. Um, I think s some of the, you know, acapella stuff that people are doing, making music together, that's all great. So anyone else want to chip in about quarantine advice before we move on to the next question? Great. So let's get into um, let, let's get into the nitty gritty about teaching college trumpet a little <clears> bit here. For you, what do you find is like the most common trumpet playing weakness you find in your new students that come to you at your university? What's the most common weakness you find in the trumpet playing? Tone production. Period. Consistent tone production. That that makes it easy to play the easier to play the trumpet. Yeah, I was going to say centering centering the tone. Yeah. You know, yeah. being in the middle of the notes. Agreed. All the things that Chickowitz and uh, Bill Adam and all those people talk about are the essence of, of playing. It's making a sound. Trumpet is not musical. Yeah. It's mechanical. Mm -hmm. We're musical. Mm -hmm. Marlon? I think uh, from my perspective, uh, goes deeper than just some of the guiding principles that I know that we all started with. Um, I know when I say tone, time, and accuracy that that's not a foreign concept to the people that are on this, this panel. However, um, I think we're experiencing in America some of this um, issues that stem from the No Child Left Behind legislation, where it actually reduced and eliminated a lot of the music programs across the country in K-12. through So there are fewer kids that are coming out of school with some of those fundamental things that they learned from sixth grade through 12th, um, which are showing up sort of in our studios. I'm, you know, getting students and I've seen students who didn't even start playing the trumpet until they got to high school, which is bizarre. You know, I started in third grade playing cello, then moved to middle school to playing the trumpet. Uh, and some of these kids aren't even seeing a horn until they get to high school and a lot of them are using it as an opportunity to keep them off the street from gangs or whatever else. And so um, the, while it's a positive thing, some of the kids are coming in with, like you said, the lack of the fundamentals uh, of tone production, um, not able to read music properly or negotiate <laughs> them's. These are all sorts of things that I've come across um, in just the last five years of teaching. I'd like to expand on this, if I may. Uh, the, the biggest thing that I think that students come with, I see, is that uh, most of them don't understand that to achieve any success, there is a there is a commitment to a tremendous work ethic that they do not have. Yeah. I teach I teach most of my students time management and discipline to work hard relentlessly to achieve a worthwhile goal. I set them up on a 6 a.m. to midnight schedule, and I really do do this. I want to know when they wake up, when they eat breakfast, when they're going to practice, when they go to school, and if they are going to practice two hours from 10 to 12, what are they going to do in that period? Because mm -hmm. I, believe, I believe most of them are fundamentally weak, like Vince said, and, and others agree. Sound is the most important thing to me. And if you get the air moving, it's amazing how the, the tension in other areas of the body frees up when the air is going through the horn like it should. And so um, I get into a tremendous amount of uh, uh, just talking with the student about their desires and make sure that their work ethic matches their desire. 
so that they leave and they're fundamentally sound and they're ready to tackle on whatever it is they're going to achieve in the next uh, uh, after they leave me. Yeah, dreams are great. They got to be backed up by actions. Yep. yep. Really? <laughs> I, would, I, would, um, if I, I would like to um, add on to this conversation in that I, what I found with a lot of incoming students, um, convincing them that listening is just as important as physically playing the trumpet. If you do not have an oral concept of what you want to sound like, that's right. You're yeah. never going to have the sound that you that you want to, to sound like. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's convincing them that, hey, just take 30 minutes out of your day, 30 minutes to an hour, because recordings are so accessible. I'm sure every one of us, you know, has like Naxos free library, Spotify. You have all these streaming services with all these albums we had to go out and hunt for. Like, I remember like going to Borders or going to like, you know, some Sam Goody to find a recording or having to have to order it and wait for weeks to get it. And now all you got to do is go on your, on your um, phone yeah. and, and, and get a great recording. And, yeah. um, you know, just trying to shift them from the YouTube mentality to saying, hey, check out Tom Stevens, you know, listen to this yeah. CD, you know, like um, just getting them to, to, to match that the listening is going to help them reach their, their playing goals too. So like, like I said in the past, you know, like about if you're going to, I have my students say, if you, if you're a person, let's say that is taking lessons for fun, you only practice a half hour a day. Well, then you need to listen a half hour a day. Mm -hmm. And if you're a person that, you know, it's like a music ed major and you're, you practice an hour a day, hour and a half, maybe you should listen an hour and a half a day and maybe even listen to some more literature for, for band and for teaching. Yeah. And then if you're going to be a professional player and you're practicing three hours a day, you should listen at least three hours a day mm -hmm. because the, the scenarios that we have to play in, I mean, you got to know what costume to have on. You got to know, you know, you got to know all this stuff. You just show up. And it's got to be like, you know, like you're in the right in the right film, you know, that's right. And, and I think if you're not, well, everybody knows it, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, you're not doing your job. That's right. But, but that listening aspect, if you're going to err, err on the side of listening more and practicing less, but you're going to sound better. Even if your, your face isn't better, you're going to, you're going to be, you know, playing musically better and everything like that. So, you know, and hopefully you won't do that, but, but I mean, I, I think that that listening part is just, essential it's it's the essential item i mean the people that i've uh taught that have had really good listening habits before they came to the university are always uh mm -hmm. more well put together uh, students even if they're physically not well put together mm -hmm. yeah i'd have to agree on on the listening thing i'm always shocked with especially like incoming students it's one of the first questions i ask is who do you listen to and I get more blank stares than, <laughs> than I'm comfortable with. They just don't know. And I think, you know, like George said, getting them away from the YouTube mentality. I think I think students now suffer from, like, overexposure to, yes. like, they have access to so much, they don't know where to begin. And it yeah. becomes, like, so, like, the concept of sitting and listening to, like, a whole album start to finish is, like, foreign. It's like, why would I listen to three of the same song, you know? same people in a row I can go down the next YouTube thing and, uh, and and people just don't know who who they're listening to you know so I, that's something I always try to encourage like okay who is who who's recording is that do you know who they are like right. where they play like what have they done like who are these people right. um, so that's that's always a, a big challenge it's kind of exciting though because then it's like a blank slate of like you don't know who to listen to well, I can I can yeah. face the right direction yeah, most students don't know who to listen to. You know, yeah. one one of the first questions we ask is, "Can you name Can you name your top twenty trumpet players that you listen to every day?" And you get all, you're right, you get all these blank <laughs> stares. I can name two or three. That's about it. Yeah. yeah. Right, right. If you're lucky, yeah. 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 Great. We've talked about some trumpet playing weaknesses. Uh, what about non-trumpet playing weaknesses you find in students? Um, issues that students have that are not intrinsically musical that are keeping them back from being uh, successful in college time management, time management yeah <laughs> yeah. Time management. yeah that's it time they management. want to they want to be successful tomorrow yes and right or so, they don't understand there's a price to pay mm -hmm. yeah yeah um in order to be successful you have to be extraordinary 
extraordinary is not smart because if that was the case uh, i would i'd be in bad trouble but, <laughs> but uh but extraordinary means that you 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 do something to the nth degree mm -hmm. and you spend much more time at it than most people do and you know like if you ever talk to somebody like you know uh, bud herseth bud herseth kept meticulous notes on his practicing nobody not many people know that but he 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 knew everything about what he was doing he was very organized and and uh you know i i think that there's a lot to that you have to really put it doc severinson i mean when i played for him the first time i got a cold sweat and the reason was he just was like this And I finally had to stop playing because I got a cold sweat. I said, Doc, what are you doing? He goes, well, I don't understand it. You're doing this and it. I mean, the guy studies all the whole day. Yeah. You know, and you listen to some of these recordings and you go, just the, just the sheer trumpet ability. I mean, let alone, you know, the, some of the things he, he emotionally did. Yeah. I mean, uh, and that's what it takes for every, you know, some people are uh, extraordinarily gifted in certain areas and they've spent an, an inordinate amount of time doing that. So I think that that's the kind of, uh, that's the kind of uh, co uh, conviction that, uh, that, uh, that Greg is talking about and everybody's talking about. Yeah. You know, when, uh, when you find a student like that, you can't wait for them to come to their lesson. Mm. Yeah. Right? Yeah, you know it. Oh, yeah. You're going, oh, I got, what's his name's come today? Oh, she's great. She does everything. She, man, she comes in and she's got, she's got all this stuff. And she thinks about things I never even thought of. Yeah, this is great. A lot of fun to teach. That's, that's it. Yep. You know, and I mean, I was, like I say, you know, and, uh, Dave Welch, who was uh, Stacy's teacher, uh, Brad Good, Al Hood. Todd Hasty, all these people were at school at the same time. It was like, I just can't even think about it anymore. It was so great. I looked forward, I always look forward to every lesson, but I especially look forward to those ones because I knew they were gonna bring in something extraordinary that they've been working on. Like Al Hood, he'd come in and he'd go, oh, well, you know, I've been working on the Antile Sonata. Yeah, I don't know, it's really hard. I say, what are you talking about? Good. He says, yeah, but I, keep, I keep missing this little place over here. Yeah, I said, well, I, I was missing the first bar. So I, you know, yeah, I mean, it's extraordinary when you work with those people. And they have, ex those te I think those people also are uh, challenging to teach because you don't want to... Uh, yeah. Uh, disturb their growth yes. it's easy to do that yeah you know brad good was very challenging to teach because he was such a unique player uh, especially in the jay he could play classical trumpet really well but his jazz playing i mean i used to say he'd come in and i'd say what are you playing what's that, that you're playing for me well i was at the club the other night and you played i said worry about what I played forget that. that's not important I said what are, what are you playing what can I help you with that you are trying to do and that was the fun for me too that was a real challenge because I I had to grow into his into his style yeah. of playing and boy that's teaching is great what can I I'll tell you one thing yeah. you know the, the most I'm jumping the gun here, but for, for me, the, the most pleasure I get out of teaching is personally watching the transformation that takes place from when they come in as a freshman to when they graduate. They are different people. We're so, we're so blessed to do what we do. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, great. Great. That's a good, that's a good uh, way to, to move on to the good segue to the next question, I think, Greg. So, uh, but, but speaking of when they come in, we have, we all have, uh, you know, freshmen that are about to come in and sometimes they have uh, maybe a, a tepid interest in music. So what is your advice for that student who's maybe interested or maybe casually interested in a music career, but maybe they have friends or teachers or parents saying, there's no mu money in music, there's no jobs in music. What advice do you have for those students? I know. Uh, I'd, I'd like to add to that one. I'd like to add to that one. 
<laughs> Go ahead, Reese. Um, well, trumpet is a lifelong life journey. It's a journey. It's a long, you, you never get there. Right, um, uh, you never, you never get there. I mean, I, there's a couple of guys in here, a year or two older than me that could probably vouch for that. Um, but it's important to note that it's a lifelong journey, but it's a, it's a, it's a joyful journey. It's a, it's a wonderful journey. If you have a growth mindset and you're willing to, to look down the road and see what the possibilities are, it's wonderful. Is there money in music? No, there's no money in music. <laughs> I mean, come on, let's be frank. There's not. I mean, there's money in music. You could, we can all make a living in it. It's a fact. But you're not going to be, you know, building a giant skyscraper in the middle of downtown Louisville, what you're going to make in music. That's not the point. But the reward is so great. I mean, I, this profession has brought me to all of you. I find it very valuable. And, uh, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. There's so many more. Uh, the places that I've traveled, the places that I've been and played, the places that I've met people and heard play, yeah. it's, it's mm -hmm. enormous. It, there's no way to put a value on that. That's what I have to say about that. And it's not an all or nothing kind of a prospect. Maybe mm -hmm. they do a music minor and stay involved and, and do something else professionally to, to make their money as it were. But there, there's so much that you can gain from it emotionally. And um, I just, you know, people that are playing in high school, I just absolutely hate it when they just kick the horn under the bed and when they yeah. get to college and yeah. they're done with it. Playing mm -hmm. the ensembles, take some mm -hmm. half hour lessons with people, find <clears> some <throat> way to stay involved. You presumably enjoyed it in high school if you stayed in for that long. Yeah. You don't have to just be a music major or not play at all. There's there's so many degrees in between. Pick one. I I uh, over half of the things that I do in music that I've done my whole life I've done for free, way over half. Okay, and I I uh, some of my most uh, I play funerals. I play gravesides. I play. Uh, uh, weddings for friends. I don't play any other weddings anymore. No more weddings. Uh, and I, I play, <laughs> you know, when I, when I go to the grocery store, uh, somebody will go, I know you. And I'll go, you do? You're the guy that plays in the town band and plays the solos. I get, that's exactly who I am. See, so the money part of it is really, you know, like when I go and play, I've played, you know, just about everywhere. And you play a solo in Carnegie Hall and somebody's going, Oh, that was quite good. <laughs> I think I think it was very good Haydn Trumpet Concerto. I don't know if I like it as much as Winton's. I'm going, Well, hell, who cares? You know what I mean? <laughs> you you play at somebody's funeral and somebody comes up to you afterwards and says, you know, this was the toughest day of my life and you made it better. Mm -hmm. yeah, you don't lose you don't lose sight of of you don't you lose your grounding see that's what we're never climbing a ladder all of my professional development has been for the most part in kentucky i've lived here almost my whole life i've played with all kinds of groups everything from a junior high school band you know i play a improvise at a church service on sundays and i you know and i played in Carnegie Hall. But to me, it's all the same. It doesn't, you know, I'm, I'm emotionally the same. And the things we get out of music, as we're all saying, and as Reese says, uh, you know, it's, what do you want? How many, how many happy, rich people do you know, except for how many things they have? I mean, you know, uh, I'm, I've been happy my whole life. And I've, you know, just, I get by. And, and, and uh, I'm happy. You know, if I can get another trumpet or some music and a few of those wooden mutes, I'm, I'm a happy guy, you know? <laughs> and I think yes, you've you got, are. <laughs> you've got to have a realistic approach. You know, that's one of the things that we have to do as teachers. We have to express the value of what we do as being part of a community of some sort. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really matter where you are. I live in Danville, Kentucky. When there's five people at the line, I want to know what's going on in town. Yeah. You know, I mean, I think it's important to find your place. And when I moved to Kentucky, 
I found a place where I was needed. Mm-hmm. I felt like there was a need for me here. And, and all of you are in the same position. I get excited just seeing all the young, youngest teachers getting jobs and, you know, and, and being able to experience some of the great things I have in the state of Kentucky, work with some of the bands, you know, work with some of the high school trumpet players. And, uh, you know, it, it's just a wonderful, you know, if you're living in the middle of New York, I mean, l- let me just tell you, when I show up to visit one of my friends in New York City, okay, I have to meet them in the pit entrance to the, to the show. They walk in and they're eating Chinese food. They're, they're just late. And then they, okay, I'll talk to you. I'll talk to you in 10 minutes. I got a break. And they walk into the pit with their Chinese food and they sit down and they play the opening thing and they grab their Chinese food and they eat it. They put the Chinese food down and they come out and talk to me. I mean, I don't want to live like that. <laughs> I mean, really, I come home. I, I you know, every day I, I cook breakfast, lunch and dinner for my wife. I've done that forever. I love doing that. And I think that's one of the things that Jason was talking about too. We all have a, you know, a similar life goal. The further you move into the, the life cycle, the further you realize the importance of what you're doing in, in perspective. You're not looking to climb a ladder. You're not looking for any specific recognition. You're just looking to accomplish what you want to accomplish. Mm-hmm. And I'm excited that I've been lucky enough to do a lot of that. And so have you all. I mean, I know almost everybody here really well. And I think about all the things you're doing. And I'm so excited about that. You know, because because it, it helps me to think that the time I've spent with people your age, most of you are younger, has really been worthwhile. Because you're yeah, all I- such wonderful role models. For, for young people. And that's a big part of what mm-hmm. we do. George, that you have is your hand much, up? much yeah, more important. I was going to, because Vince really hit on something that um, it was like, boom, like it was like a um, full circle moment because I I met Vince as an oh. undergrad at University <laughs> of Tennessee in Knoxville. Oh, and um, he was coming down um, there with Doc and, uh, and uh, he came and he was just hanging like Doc was um, doing something. I forget what, what I think it was a Shire's Trumpets presentation or something like that. And and um, I never met I never uh, met Vince before, but I was like, OK, I know that name. And Kathy was telling me about who, who he was. And I was like, OK, cool. So um, I'll never forget this. You and uh, you started playing the Arvin character stun number one. And then you said then you told us, you know, have you guys ever played that in B? And you started playing it in B major. And I just was like, oh my God, what in the world? Like, and he, he kept, I was like, okay, when he gets to that, he's going to stop. He did not stop. He kept going. I was like, what? and I was like, okay, one day I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to be able to do this. And so um, that like, and then now 10 years later, 10, 11 years later, I'm sitting here on a zoom chat with you, like uh, as a colleague and it's, like, can you play it? It, no, <laughs> still working on it, but it's, it's crazy because it's crazy because this is more for the undergraduates who are watching. Like, you start your relationships as soon as you step on campus, it doesn't just happen like overnight. You're a professional, you start yes. as soon as you get on campus. Like, everyone mm-hmm. you meet, you know, those impressions are lasting. So, you know, it's, as soon as you get on campus, you start treating yourself as a professional. Like you don't, you don't, you don't wait for it. You you take the you take the opportunity right then and there. Even if you, you know, if you don't feel like you can play like your your heroes, eventually you will be able to. And um, you have to just keep that. You know, I'm a professional. I'm training to be a professional as soon as you get in college. And that's and that's what's really helped me is that I've always thought of, you know, even though I'm in college as a student, I'm training to get to where these people are. So yeah. And One beyond. Of the one of the questions that I ask all my incoming freshmen, regardless of who they are, is that, do you remember the first day that you opened up your trumpet trumpet case and you saw the trumpet inside? Mm-hmm. And and they say, yeah. And then I try to expand upon that. If they're, if they're feeling sorry for themselves, I'll, I'll say, 
what happened to that spark when you opened the cake? Mm. Mm-hmm. And if they're feeling real good about that, then I'll reaffirm, yeah, isn't it great that you opened up that case and, and the spark is still there? So everybody deserves a chance to succeed. What I feel that we're best at is that we're human beings first, trumpet players second. Everybody wants to be, be made to feel that they're special. And, and, and you know what I mean. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It, it, it it's a wonderful like, thing. Uh, Even for Stacy, it's a wonderful thing. I got to bust your chops, man. Come on. Thanks, man. <laughs> Thanks, man. <laughs> Love you, Stacy. Keep it real. Always keep it real with Wing. Experiences and relationships. <laughs> but then the other side of it is the part that I used to always kind of get confronted with, which is how do I make a living doing this? Mm-hmm. And then, of course, people comparing uh, the performance side to the education side, saying that you're not going to make a living if you're a performer versus an educator. And I have all of my students just basically write it all out. So when I was at IU, I taught a studio of 10 students a week and I charged $50 a lesson. And that was for an hour lesson. And, and well, I charged 60, but if you paid in advance, you got a $10 break. So yeah. At any rate, if you boil it down to essentially $50, that's $500 a week uh, that you would be making uh, as a private lesson instructor. Plus, I taught a couple of adjunct classes, and I played on average about two two gigs, Friday, Saturday, and then I played a church gig. So, you know, the average on that is about 100 bucks. So if you add that money up every week, right? It's about the base salary of a, of a teacher coming right out of uh, undergrad. The only problem is, is that you have to talk to the students and have them understand that you have to learn how to be entrepreneurial if you're going to be in the music business and you have to understand how to manage that money. Because when you are a music educator, someone's taking out your insurance, someone's taking out your 401k, someone's taking out, you know, your flexible spending account or whatever it is that those things are taken care of for you. But if you're a musician and a performer, you have to set up your own Roth IRA. You have to set up, you know, go into the Affordable Care Act and set up your insurance. You have to possibly get a life insurance policy and you have to be responsible. Uh, So, you know, it it is possible to make the same amount of money. One person uh, has to be a little bit more resourceful and responsible because you don't know necessarily where your money's coming from all the time. But the other person uh, has a limited amount of growth. My growth potential as a performer is, is limitless. Whereas if I'm an educator, until I go and get my master's or advanced degrees, I'm going to be making that same amount of money year after year. And you only get additional stipends as you take on other responsibilities. So, it, you know, it's, it's just being able to present that to the students up front and have them think about that. There's no right or wrong. It's just what decision do you want to do and, and what makes you happy? Um, and you have to think about those things. You know, what is your quality of life? What do you expect from your life? At least from my perspective on that. Um, but I agree with Eric and everybody else who spoke that those experiences that we've had as musicians uh, are kind of like those commercials where they say, you know, two tickets to the Mets game and uh, a discover card is priceless. You know, it's like me <laughs> taking a student to Costa Rica a few years back where he had never even been on a plane before. And here we are playing in uh, a celebration of blackness in a four hour parade in Limon. It was incredible. And that's something that you can't put a price on, uh, in my opinion. And to see his face and to see those experiences uh, shape him musically and, and from a human standpoint as well, you know, it's been amazing for me. Wonderful. All of you are fantastic role models. You see, that's that's the key. I mean, how many? Why are did you go into music because your band director was a real drag, or your orchestra <laughs> director hated you? No. no, you 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 know, or you know, if you had Ron Holtz as your director, you you'd have to be the happiest guy in the world. Yeah. You know, I used to call him up and ask him what he was doing. And he'd say, oh, well, I have to do this at 12 o'clock. And then at 12.45, I'm doing this. <laughs> and at 3 o'clock, I'm doing this. And I'd say, I'd say, well, what did you want, by the way, when you called? I said, oh, I just wanted to be humbled. Thanks, Ron. To me, he was one of my role models. Because he, took, he made use of every moment of time. And not for himself. 
for others. And you all are great role models for that. That's what's so exciting about being a trumpet teacher for me in Kentucky, being even a, a past trumpet teacher in Kentucky, is to see what you're doing and what an impact you're having. You, you won't have to, uh, when their parents meet you, most of them are really happy, aren't they? <laughs> they're happy, they're studying with you, they're, they meet you, you put them at ease because they can see the success you have a real person view of life and to them that means that you can help their student their mm -hmm. son and daughter be successful give them at least a chance at and mm -hmm. how to blossom out and grow and and you role model them i mean good gosh i mean my i thought my son was going to be a paleontologist you know and he ended up being a trumpet player yeah. oh my <laughs> god but <laughs> but but uh but i mean it's you know, he, I hear him do things now, and I go, where did you hear that? He said, well, I think when I was a kid, I heard you doing that. I said, oh, okay. Well, all right. You know, I, I never really, really thought about it. But no matter if it's your own kid or somebody else's, you, you're not really acting any different. You're, 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 you're helping them to become disciplined people, sensitive people, understanding people, uh, you know, I have a list that I give, uh, Reese knows that, and, uh, and, and a lot of you guys have seen that list, things to do. I'll send it to you all. Uh, it, it, it says, uh, you know, did you walk past somebody today and act like you weren't interested in them? I've done it sometimes. And I, I haven't I, walked past anybody in a few days. <laughs> <laughs> what day is it anyway? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think when we're on our regular operational basis, I, I, I know almost everybody fairly well. And I know that you're that kind of people. You're the person that you want your kids to hang around with. I, I send my kids to anybody. But if, if I had ones that were younger than you, I would. <laughs> but, but, uh, but I think it's really important that uh, that's what we need to impress on the parents when they, when they come up with a, a thing like that. And, and I do, and I'll say, you know, I've had students that come up to me and say, when do you want me to audition? And I say, you don't have to audition. I go, what? I said, you're already auditioned. You're a good person. You seem to be very disciplined and hardworking. Man, I can teach you how to plant flowers and you'd be good at it. <laughs> so right. I'm, not wor I'm not worried about you as long as you're on that path, mm -hmm. you know? And I'll tell you what, I've had a lot of kids that were way smarter than me, especially when I got to Center College. And some of those people, Matter of fact, most of them are professional trumpet players, and they went to Center College. They didn't play in a band. They played in a lousy orchestra twice a year. Uh, they played in a trumpet ensemble that was pretty good. They got some skills in there. But it's because they took care with what they were doing, and their parents trusted us. Their parents trusted us to do a good job with their kids. I mean, like when I, like I said, when I left Gabriel at Interlochen, when he was 16, man, I almost, I didn't make it out of the parking lot. It was, it was rough, you know, but I never was, I never was sorry. After the fourth month when I showed up there and they played the Pines of Rome and I was a good thing I sat in the back, man. I was just a total mess. It was so beautiful. I've never heard anything that beautiful done by kids that were between 15 and 18. I mean, and he went off stage and played the off stage trumpet solo. And I, oh my God, it was just, I, 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 I called my wife and I just put the phone up. I said, I can't talk. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything, you know? And that's the thing that we do for kids. And a place like that does even more because it's every, they, those kids spread out all over the whole world once they leave Interlochen. But when they're there in high school, I never really, I just was there in the summer, you know. But in, during the school year, oh my gosh, that orchestra is just as good as the one in the summer. Mm -hmm. You know? And, A lot and, of time. Yeah, and you hear those kids interacting like that. And it's it's uh, fantastic. And we have we don't have to have a whole faculty like that. 
we have a place to teach. We have students that want to learn. And we have us who love to teach and want to see successful human beings. And, and it's just so exciting when I go to every one of the schools. I've been to every school in Kentucky. And, you know, I, I'm excited whether they're biology majors or they're, you know, trumpet fanatics. It doesn't really matter. They're wonderful young people that we get to work with. And, that's, and their parents trust us to do that. Mm. They trust us to do that. So that's great. What more could, you know, what more could we want? And their parents are happy. I mean, when their parents come to graduation, you could all experience that. Thank you so much. You've changed the life of my daughter. You've changed the life of my son. You know, you've given them something that I, I just didn't believe they would have. But when I went to their senior recital, uh, that was the greatest thing for us, you know, parents. So, so you know, you should feel great about what you do. I, I do. I still feel great. You know, I don't have as much patience as I used to, you know, uh, because I, I don't really teach any students. <laughs> it's very like, rewarding, I, great, right? Vince. I wish I would have had a, made a tape of all the excuses <laughs> that people gave me why they didn't practice for their lesson. <laughs> that, everybody be good... in their studio. Everybody be in their studio. Go, oh yeah, that's oh, I know that one. <laughs> this this is a good segue, Vince, to the next yes. question. Good Speaking job. of excuses, yes. Uh, so, <laughs> so what do you do with your current students? You got a student; they're a music major. And they seem to be doing pretty well in their classes. They maybe they want to be a band director or they want to work in the music industry. They have a specific like career direction. They know they want to do that, but they make excuses for what they do on the trumpet. They don't have a particular value for trumpet. They say, well, "I just want to be a band director. Why do I have to learn the Ken Kenan trumpet sonata?" Mm -hmm. What What do you do with those students who do want to be mu music musicians uh, as a career, but they don't see the value in private trumpet study? Well, the first thing I do is I kick him out of the lesson. <laughs> oh, old school. Yeah. That's usually, no, I'm kidding aside. I've done that 20 years. And, it, and the word gets around the school in 10 seconds. And, and uh, yeah. it's amazing. So you're talking about an attention getter. That'll get their attention. <laughs> but yeah. unfortunately, you know, you don't have to do that too often. What I, what I tell the, the music education student is I treat my music education students the same as all my students. Mm -hmm. I ask them, I says, how are you going to phrase if you can't play it? How are you going to teach someone how to do this if you can't do it? Yeah. Don't, you think Amen. It's, mm -hmm. don't you think it's important for you to show proficiency on your instrument so you can demonstrate it? Yeah. I mean, you know, so I kind of hit home with that. And then, you know, then we get into the desire and the work ethic. And I have to say this. Let, let me say this real quickly. I do a lot of clinics, a lot of master classes as well. and very, very fortunate to visit a lot of band rooms. And I always tell the students this. Whether you're going to major in music or whether you're going to major in biology, it doesn't matter as long as you put everything that you have into what it is you're going to do, that you love it, that you're passionate about it, that you're a student about it, and trust me, you'll be very successful in whatever you do. Yes. And I just yes. kind of leave it alone there. Yep. I, I too try to um, put as um, put as many parallels to what their passion is to what the apply what the apply lesson will serve them. So, for instance, say someone wants to be a band director, but they're not trying to be the next um, Maurice Andre or or whatever. So. You take the Kent Kenan sonata since uh, Greg t uh, talked about that. Um, let's look at the score, okay? So can you prepare this score as if you're gonna get ready to prepare first suite for host? Can you prepare it up to that type of level? You know, because they're all the same. You try to you try to um, you try to use the Applied Studio as a hub to show them that everything that they're learning in their outside classes is coming together in this lesson. And if you can't put it all together in here, I don't expect you to do it in front of hundreds of youths. And uh, you know, so yeah, you know, the, you try, uh, and then and then the honest and the guilt gets on them. Like, ah, okay, yeah, I think I do need to prepare this a little bit. Well, yeah, one of the so. one of the things that's really important is to stress comprehensive musicianship mm -hmm. in lessons, and and uh, I am a big believer in that. I always have been. I'll say, well, uh, what's a piano doing here? Mm -hmm. They'll go, ooh, <laughs> piano. Oh yeah, oh. I, you know, and and I and I'm, I'm I say you know the form of this piece, 
it'll really help you to perform this a lot better. Let's let's talk about this. And not only that, one of the things that I one another reason that's really passive to it, but it, it becomes a big thing, is your colleagues at your university appreciate that. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. When they when they yeah. when they go to the, when you know you know did, were you teaching them the form of that canon sonata? Oh yeah, they 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 didn't know anything about it. No wonder why they couldn't play it. I said they're just blowing through it like you know. I said you know so we we talked about it. We talked about how all the movements are related, and we talked about this and that, and you know, and they and they appreciate it in the history aspect. You know, uh, the, the talk about the Hindema Sonata. You've got lots of history to talk about. Mm -hmm. You know, and so all of these things. I think if if we're concentrating on, on those things, they also see a, a value in their history class. And in their theory class, because some people are not interested in those, like I was <clears throat> when I was a student. I was called the backdoor learner to myself. I was going, how come there's no trumpet in there? You know, I mean, I, I was just wanted to know why I didn't, it wasn't a good trumpet part in this thing. You know, it's like <laughs> then I started studying. I said, well, yeah, you don't really need much trumpet in that, do you? Yeah, you know, so everything was backwards. So I, I've always taught them to, you know, to be uh, aggressive with their musicians, especially the band directors. You know, if you're a if you're a, a professional orchestra trumpet player, hell, you don't even have to know how to transpose, really. If you're if you've got a 52 week season, they, you know exactly what you're going to play every week. <laughs> you can learn it by rote if you had to, you know, and occasionally you might have to read something. But but I mean, of course, I didn't approach it that way. But but you know, a music ed student Man, I used to hate going out to schools where the band director couldn't read the score. Mm. You could tell, you could tell that they couldn't read the score. They didn't really know where they were and, and stuff. And you know, and I and I said, go to go to Lois Wiggins' school when she was teaching. She was teaching in the middle school. What was the name of that school? <clears throat> I can't remember. It. It's over in the new part of town. Well, she had every instrument on her podium clarinets, flutes, saxophones, trumpet, trombone. She played every one of them. And you know what? She got a, a decent tone on every instrument. Mm -hmm. And I just was knocked out with that. I thought that was like the greatest thing I'd ever seen in my life. She was one of the finalists in the Emmy Awards for teachers. She was one of the top 10 one year. Mm. And, you know, and, and there's a good reason for that. She was fantastic. Mm. But she just raised her hand and... <laughs> In class, it was like, Phew. I mean, it got quiet in there. I said, hell, I said, I got to learn this secret right away. <laughs> yeah, no joke. Yeah. yeah, I mean, she was, she had every aspect. And the kids that came out of her school, I had one of her kids at Interlock in last summer, the finest young man. And it's because of her. So, so all of these things, you know, there are no excuses. And I also did trumpet class, like I said, at 730 on Wednesdays, freshman trumpet class. And I found out who was serious about playing, who prepared their stuff, who didn't show up, you know? And uh, and then at the end of the year, I put the list up on who was <clears> going <throat> to study with me the next year. Mm. And I could keep banging on my door. And they'd say, how, how come I'm not on your list? I said, oh, hell, you don't need a teacher. <laughs> You must know everything already. You don't show up. <laughs> <laughs> when you do yes. play, you don't prepare. Mm. So you're really, all you need is a TA who pass off the materials with. If, if you study with me, you're going to hate it. And I'm going to hate it. Is that what you want? I don't think so. <laughs> and I didn't teach those people. Mm. I just wouldn't do it. And I, And of course, I always had my remote control car for a few years. Some of you know about the remote control car. <laughs> That's when I got I got mad. I got mad at my when you, one spring I was started to get really upset with a bunch of students, and I'd start to like yell at them. You know, I'd start to raise my voice, and I really didn't like doing that. You know, I just because I was I was just you know it was just passionate. So I, uh, the next fall I, I said I can't do that anymore. I won't make it through this year. So I took, I bought a remote control car and I put it in our first meeting for the class for the year. So I stuck it on the floor and I put the remote control on the desk and I talked through the whole, you know, you got to do this, this semester, we're going to do this, we're doing that. 
and I could see everybody was looking at that car. What's that car? You know, what's that car over there? Oh, and at the end of the class, I said, "Oh, I forgot. I forgot about the car. You're probably wondering why this car is here." So I did the Columbo on him. See, that was it was good. <laughs> you probably wondered about this car, over Columbo. Here. Yeah. So I said, "Well, you know, last spring I was I was really I wasn't a very good teacher. Sometimes I said I I was you know just stressed out a lot, and when you didn't practice, it just it really bummed me out. And I just get I lose my patience, and you know, and I don't want to do that anymore. So." If I pick up the remote control and start playing with the car, that means you should pack up immediately. <laughs> Put your horn in the case and get out. So that this way, when I'm finished, I got a little obstacle course over there. Get out. Get out. <laughs> and I'll be playing with the car and you'll be gone. And then I'll finish playing with the car and there'll be nobody to yell at. And you won't feel bad. And I won't feel bad. And I think that's going to work out really well. <laughs> I got a little more basketball does the same oh, thing. Yeah, yeah, that, that's good. Yeah, that's good. You should. Yeah. But I'm I mean, to it take was, my it was students on gigs with me as much as I can. Oh, that's good. Uh, especially like uh, Easter, you know, church services, things like that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Last year, I had some students that weren't doing kind of what I needed them to do. So I put them in a brass ensemble and we played the Frosty 5K in Frankfurt. And it was like December 7th. It was freezing. And we got up early and went out and played Christmas songs with hats and things on. And it's something about uh, when the kids are not ready and they kind of have it hanging out there for everybody to see that you're not prepared, mm -hmm. make you tighten up a bit. And then also for them to see how appreciative people are of you performing for them um, for different functions will kind of deepen their appreciation for wanting to prepare materials. So I don't know. Um, yeah, I know that when I was a student, it, it really made me feel good when my teacher asked me to go and perform with them. And, uh, you know, I try to do the same thing. Yeah, absolutely. Great. Yeah, Anyone else great. want to chip in about uh, this music? We sort of dovetailed a couple of different topics, but that that's great. Anyone can get a chance to speak? Great. Well, you know, we all play a loud instrument and right now some people are in apartments or maybe even all of us probably have a place that we can play. And I see what there's one of my answers to the question right there, George. But what advice do you have? Maybe just advice you use like when you're traveling in hotels or whatever. But what about students who want to practice? But uh, like some of my students, for example, there's their neighbors will you know stomp on the floor if they try to play trumpet. What advice do you have? for practicing when you're quarantined to an apartment or maybe advice, uh, Greg, I see you got right there. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm one to, you have to nurture these kids and sometimes they just, the obvious isn't so obvious. When I was on the road and I'd still do a lot of traveling, the best practice room for me to take away all the excuses is the right, right front seat of my car. Mm -hmm. And I mean to tell you, if you want to get parents to appreciate what you do more and feel bad about why they can't let you practice in the house, <laughs> go out in the go out in the car. I, I swear to God, this works every time. Number one, you're in your little solitude. You concentrate better. You're not worrying about what the neighbors think because you're in your car. If it's hot, turn on the air conditioning. Yep. If it's too cold, turn on the heater, put on an extra coat. But I mean, <laughs> if I want a place, you know, I mean, all the shows I do and all the traveling that I do, there's not a lot of, there's not a lot of practice facilities and trumpet is offensive to most people. They don't get it that you got to warm up and get ready. Yeah. So yeah. The, right, the right front seat of my car is my practice room when I'm traveling. I don't like practicing the practice mute and I've got five of them. And they all have different resistances. They're all good for doing little things off stage when you're getting ready to play. But if I need to warm up, I go to the, my car. I don't bother anybody. They don't bother me. And uh, most kids don't get this. Even now, I have a couple of students that said, well, I couldn't practice. My mom and dad wouldn't let me practice in the house. And I said, have you ever tried your car? It was like, it was like a, Einstein just hit him. Oh, my car. 
I never thought about it. <clears throat> Go to your car. And I have to tell them over and over and over, there are no excuses. You either do or you do not. But don't, don't pull a wool over my eyes just because your mom and dad won't let you practice in the house. My mom and dad wouldn't let me practice in the house when I was growing up. I swear to God. In Covington, Kentucky, my mom and my mom stayed home. My dad worked. When he came home, he didn't want to. Hear <clears throat> and he was a bass player singer. Mm. And, uh, I had to go out in the hollow in northern Kentucky. You know what a hollow is, right? That's oh, yeah. Yeah, behind mm -hmm. the house, down the hill, <laughs> practicing. Well, the neighbors, what really got my mom and dad is that the neighbors had a greater appreciation for all this crap I was playing than my parents did. And they, they go, <laughs> They go up to my parents' house and say, hey, your son's down there playing trumpet. He sounds pretty good. <laughs> well, after a couple of months of that, my mom and dad sort of let me play in the house now. So, <laughs> it was amazing. But anyhow, the right, the right passenger seat of your car. When I was on the road, I've been in the boiler rooms. I've been in the fire, fire uh, extinguishing rooms. I've been on rooftops. You know, if you have to do it, you do it. Yeah. I've even filled up a bucket, uh, a bucket of water. I filled up sinks. I filled up bathtubs. I've blown bubbles just to diffuse it. I've taken my bell and put it in three pillows in a closet. I mean, if you want to practice, you find ways to practice, right? Yeah. 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 Yes, you do. All right. So there you are no excuses. Right there, man. Jeez. And, and you know what? It's fun and it's therapeutic. And sometimes you just have to act silly. Yeah. 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 Okay. I'll yeah. shut up now. Yeah. For those. <laughs> For those who have an apartment, who live in an apartment, um, if your apartment complex has a clubhouse, get in the car, man. You can ask. You can ask the, the apartment manager, or leasing manager. Hey, can I get in the clubhouse and practice for an hour or two? Um, mm -hmm. If you're traveling in a hotel, um, ho most hotels have a conference room or some That's type right. of other um, empty spaces they're not occupying. If you're very nice and courteous to the front desk manager. Listen, a $5 or a $10 yeah, bill will I'm open up you. a lot of doors, man. I'm telling you. Yeah. And then, <clears throat> yeah, yeah, so. I've been yeah, talking, during like. Go talk to your neighbors first. Mm -hmm. Go say, hey, look, this is part of my gig. This is what I do. I need to do this. This is a class. I'm going to get yelled at if I don't do this. <laughs> so Communication is key. Yeah, can, can we say, key. okay, you got two hours in the morning and I'll, I'll not play the rest of the day or something yeah. like that. That Yeah, there's going to be, most folks are going to be okay with that. And there'll be mm -hmm. a couple of jerks that won't be. And then maybe you can go in the front seat of your car or go find their car and practice in the front seat of their car. <laughs> so, but One thing I've... First. Yeah. Right. One thing I've tried to encourage, like during this time in particular, it's kind of a unique time um, where a lot of buildings are empty. Churches are often kind of yeah. empty. So I've encouraged him to go like, and every church is looking for ways to serve. If oh, you yeah. go as a college student and say, listen, I'm, 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 you know, that's what I do. I have four kids. I, I can practice at home, but somebody's already taking a nap somewhere. So I'm yeah. trying to like figure it out. So I, I just go down to my church and, you know, there's a whole big, beautiful chapel with nice acoustics and nobody there. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I can, yeah. can let it out. One of the things that I have them do is kind of what I was talking about. Uh, I haven't practiced like a. Huh? <laughs> so I, I haven't practiced the ear training. So they mm -hmm. start to, they, they learn a lot of it uh, quietly. Uh, you know, uh, John Schlabach over in, uh, at uh, Ohio University, uh, he has all these patterns that he does. You know, these, these like, mm -hmm. and he has people singing these patterns. And boy, I'll tell you what, yeah. a lot of his students can play the heck out of those things. Those are good patterns. I use them here too. Yep. Yeah, mm -hmm. they're That's great. great. And, yeah. and, you know, some things also, you know, the breathing exercises and stuff, you know, that. There's so many things that you can do that warm you up in a pinch, you know, and, and if you're, you know, like in a car, I mean, I, I actually, I never used to buzz the mouthpiece at all. And now I'll buzz it some, if I'm, I have one in my, you know, that place you're supposed to put your sunglasses. <laughs> what am I going to, what am I going to do with that? I, I mean, you know, so I just pull it down and there's a, a there's a, uh, a mouthpiece visualizer. And then there's a regular exact copy of my regular mouthpiece in there. So whatever I want to do, I just pull it down and I do a little bit of that. I get my air energized. I do whatever, like Greg says, you do whatever you have to do. I have practice in the car. 
and the, and the, the security guard from the Walmart came out <laughs> and thought I or didn't know what I was doing out there. You know, you could tell he was like <laughs> ready to pull his gun out or something, you know? <laughs> and he goes, what are you doing in there? I said, well, I said, I've got to play a concert up here and the, the school's not open. And I really need to, to practice and warm up a little bit before this concert, you know, really. Can you really play that? I play a little bit. Go, oh, then they want to play. Yeah. Then they want you to play a song for them. Yeah. <laughs> and you do. At security too. And the I got, I've had to do that in different airports. <laughs> when the, when the, at different heights of uh, you know the security, mm -hmm. they yeah. made me take my trumpet out and play right at the security thing. Listen, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Why not? Oh. <laughs> yeah. Until hey, I gotta tell you. I played it. I gotta tell you guys a story about blowing the pipe. That this is off topic. But you know, on on my way to the Stardust in Vegas, we had two shows a night, six days a week, and I'm blowing the pipe on the way down to the hotel, right? Well, in Las Vegas, they've got the motorcycle cops. He pulls me over, and I'm blowing my pipe, and and all of a sudden he comes in, and his hands by his gun. I'm thinking, oh shit, what did I do? And, and he goes, what are you doing there? And I said, well, I'm blowing the pipe. I got a show to play at the Stardust at seven o'clock, and I don't want to be late. And he started laughing. He thought it was something else that I was doing besides uh, blowing the pipe. He thought you were blowing the pipe. Yeah, he, he thought, thought I, was, I was blowing the pipe. <laughs> he thought you were blowing the pipe. Yeah. <laughs> That's a true yeah. story, yeah. Sarah. Over for a mouthpiece <laughs> <laughs> On that note, maybe we should uh, go to another topic here, right? Yes. Uh, <laughs> So we've already established that, you know, having a good routine is important and a good work ethic. But let's talk about tricks for a moment. Does anyone have like a trumpet trick that they like to use? Uh, maybe a trick that maybe might seem weird or strange to others. Anyone want to share their trumpet tricks? I have several, but you want me to start? Sure, Greg. Right, yeah. Sure. Well, the one most students have difficulty lip slurring from like C to E. They have either the glottal will start popping or they'll stop the air and they'll get the breeze in there, mm -hmm. especially going from G to the C. But I found out that if I have the student play a scale, da -dee -dee, and they'll do that with the acceleration of the air. And then we do E, one and two, ba -dee, and then I will have them do with their left hand, left hand on the bell while they're holding the trumpet. Body, and then they they fictitiously push down with their vowel. Something interesting happens to the lip slur. Mm. All it is is all it is a diversion. We're changing the students' thinking. They're not thinking about how to do the slip slur anymore. They're thinking about pushing down on the fictitious bell, yeah. which frees up whatever it needs to free up, and the lip slur comes out like a million bucks ten times out of ten. Mm. I got one. I got one good one. I teach people how to tongue fast right away. So teach teach them what? I teach them how to tongue fast because most people always say they have trouble tonguing and they slow down or they do that. Yeah. So what I do is I say, well, you ever played like a, you know, now presenting Jason Doble. I said, well, yeah, that's good, but well, Jason's a really nice guy. You should at least give him two notes before you hold the note, you know? Okay, that's a little bit better. But Jason's got his doctorate. So, <laughs> man, he really should get three notes because he's got three degrees. I mean, really, you know? Okay, and, I, and then they, I say, well, how fast were those notes that you played? And they don't see, they're not thinking about it the same way that they think about it. Like you divert their, their, their mind. They played three really, four really fast notes. Okay, now I say, just put a repeat sign on that. See, mentally they understand that. That makes sense to them. And it also gives them uh, the muscle memory. See, and then you have them do it. You have them do it with a with a long tone in between. Too. See, then you cut out the, you edit out the long note, 
And it really works. I mean, I do it with classes, like, you know, if I'm doing a master class, there's a lot of people, and you know, they, they don't get self-conscious that way, you know, and they'll try anything. And then the other way is to do it. See, and I force myself to try to stay in tempo, no matter how fast I go. So this way I, I learned to be real flexible with, with my, my own approach. I, I, I pick a tempo and then I just do it. And sometimes it doesn't work out that well, but boy, I, I get pretty close. <laughs> and it's way faster than I ever have to single tongue. You know, I didn't know it. I didn't know you could double tongue when I was in high school. I thought you just tongue fast like Rafael Mendez. I, I didn't know you could double tongue. I didn't know what that was. So I ended up saying, I can't tongue as fast as him, but I'm I'm getting closer. You know, <laughs> it was just hysterical. And when I got to high school, I would say, man, all these people, they're even worse than I am. I, I just thought that I was terrible, you know, because it's, I think it's a lot of it is mental. You know, it's our, you know, so if we can figure out ways, you know, I, that's what I do at home here. I try to figure out ways that I can stay, you know, at least uh, operating at a, at a decent level, you know, it, and I, I find it exciting to teach people things like this. Because, because it gets them thinking a different way. And then when they come across problems on their own, they're, li they're, they're not as afraid to try things. You know, and, and that's, that's, uh, that's, that's one little trick anyway. That, that's... Mm -hmm. Other tricks, guys? Uh, I, I use one very often, um, but it's very hard to demonstrate on, on Zoom. But it's much like what we heard Vince doing uh, when he was whistling and doing his ear training. Uh, it's not a whistle so much, but it's just airstream, right? So, it, you know, as we uh, propel our air, as we get it moving, as we go higher and higher, and we work on that compression of the tongue, which we don't exactly want to talk about with students, but we can produce that by blowing the air. And, and you can actually get them to uh, feel what that, or simulate what that's like on the trumpet instead of them going and just trying to blow as, yeah. they blow can. as hard as right. possible. Yeah. Right. And so I use a lot of wind patterns um, with the students that I know are going to understand this concept. Um, and, and, and with the others, you know, a lot of times it's just using as we all know, blowing into the hand and, and lengthening and, and blowing that way. But the but the airstream trick, like what Vince was demonstrating earlier with his little patterns in ear training, um, is what I use a lot with my students to get them to really get the support they need to play the notes that they're trying to do with a good centered tone, right? That's what we're trying to, to do with the least amount of resistance. With a couple of kids, if I get them and they're not moving enough air, like, like Stacy was saying, I found that getting a wind speed meter and a straw, yeah. mm -hmm. so you can say, okay, I need you to blow three meters per second on this. And they'll just, they'll try it and go, oh, that was two. Okay, well, try again. Well, that was two and a half. Okay, try again. <laughs> that was three. Okay, good. Or whatever the number is. Now put that on the horn and it's kind of a, a quick way for them to realize that what they're feeling isn't necessarily what's coming out of the instrument. So it's a good way to keep them focused on what's happening outside of their body and not the process that's going on inside. I don't do it with everybody, but if I have somebody that's a chronic under breather or under blower, I'll, I'll use that trick with them just to kind of shock the system and then see if I can transition that over to the horn. That's right. Yeah, it's all, it's all the, what we call it, diversion. Trying yeah. to create a diversion so they don't think about how to do the darn thing. And it's objective too. You can yeah. say, okay, what did you get? Um, and it's, it's not what they feel. It's not what they think. It's that's what the meter said. So mm -hmm. let's do it. Yeah. Marlon? That's my weirdest trick. Um, I was having uh, issues, similar issues with what you guys are, are talking about with uh, not getting the students to blow a steady stream of air with uh, without a lot of of uh, resistance or just overblowing. Uh, either they were under or they were over. And so I had them take out, because you know this is real big with technology uh, today, I had them take out their cell phones and the voice memo app that you have on your phone, 
if you hit the record button and you play into it, it shows you a sound wave uh, that you can see. And so a good solid trumpet sound, you'll see a solid thick wave going the whole time. And it was that visual element of them seeing the wave going rippling versus just solid that really kind of got them to understand how they need to blow into the, into the um, horn. So uh, that's just something quick <clears throat> that you may consider using and that'll help you utilize <laughs> technology as well and give them a visual element for how they should be blowing into the horn. Yeah, yeah there's some great tools in the, the tonal energy, the analysis portion. Yeah. Of that. Sarah, do you have your hand up? Yeah, I was just going to say, uh, I did, I do the same thing that Marlon did, um, except what I'll do is I'll record uh, with the student and I'll record myself playing something and have them watch the little line, you know, mm -hmm. go and then have them record the same thing after me and then they can see the difference mm -hmm. in, uh, in the steadiness of the sound and that really immediately gets them to figure it out. So yeah, that's a great idea. I love that. I do that too. Um, and speaking of diversion, um, diverting their ideas um i had one little trick that uh that i was taught where uh i have students play with their left hand and they uh um you know it slows and forces them to slow everything down did somebody say this already sorry i've been cutting getting no, cut no, 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 no. <laughs> um, but but uh that that really works uh for me and engages the other side of the brain slows it down uh gives them that tactile uh, motion on the other side uh, when they're learning a really technical <clears throat> passage so i switched to the left hand full time about a month ago because oh. I I have uh, overuse syndrome, uh, vocal dystonia in this finger. And uh, so I switched to the left hand and uh, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting pretty good at it, but it takes, a, it takes a tremendous amount of tenacity and perseverance to not throw it through the wall. <laughs> Cat, he's being too modest. We played with him last year in the reading band at KMEA. And he had just switched over just a few weeks before that, that performance. This guy was playing all kinds of stuff with his left hand. Yeah, that is a fact. No, that he's is a, a freak fact. of nature. He's not I'm, normal. I'm the David Copperfield of trumpet, and don't you forget it. <laughs> George, you have another trick? Yeah. Um, if you have an iPhone, uh, a fun trick to do with a student who's uh, playing like something that's really technical or cornet solo or something like that film it put it in slow motion yep. Ooh. and they can see the Ooh. valve strokes yeah. wow. they're really putting Ooh. pushing down the valves yeah. and like so it's like yeah you know they plan that they plan they're playing the debutante they think they're really getting it and then you just like slow it down and it's like mm -hmm. uh. yeah. that's a great idea yeah. rich Hillman used to do that rich Hillman used mm -hmm. to do that with all his students Mm -hmm. he'd, he'd, uh, he'd, you know, he'd have him play like a straight tone and then tonguing and you'd hear do, do. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. and his student would be oh my god that's horrible you know <laughs> some, some students seem like they have trouble with understanding that you don't you never stop the airstream from going yeah uh, the tongue interrupts it but it never stops yes. and yeah. so oh, sometimes I, I thought you I, did <laughs> and <laughs> about so <laughs> sometimes I have them uh, visualize like I, I will take them into the bathroom and talk to them about when I was a kid you know you used to turn on the faucet and pretend you were a ninja karate chop the water you notice that the water never stops it continues to come down and so I will draw that on a on the uh, on a dry erase board like two different ways like don't play like you're blowing bubbles where each individual bubble comes out and floats away you need to play like a string of pearls so like everything is connected each note each subsequent note so just some of those visual element cues are helpful mm -hmm. well uh sorry jeffrey i think i cut you off though oh no no that's all right i actually i do i make a lot of comparisons to air and water like it's a good visual um you know and that that interrupting you know airstream type of thing uh, but one thing I use a lot, um, my students is just, you know, we use the lead pipe often to warm up, but I'll have them take their, their tuning slide out a lot. Um, just, especially on a really difficult technical passage, um, because it disconnects like, you know, diversion has kind of been the theme of all of these, but like it disconnects the valves from what's happening with their air and their tongue. And you yeah. see it so often how like bad valves kind of 
come back to create bad articulation and bad air. Um, and I'm trying to remind them that, that the air is the first thing and then the articulation kind of bounces on that. It doesn't get to the valves for quite a bit of tubing. You know, let's, mm -hmm. let's get that really good. Um, so taking the tuning side out and having them get the valves right on with their articulation uh, just kind of like helps to do that. A side note is that, that make sure that they're, that their instrument's actually in working order, uh, <laughs> that they can actually take the tuning slide out. Yeah, it actually comes out. <laughs> yeah, so it, it, it kind of works work both ways that way, but yeah. I have one too that goes back to the valves, if, you know, they're getting the air steady. So if, you're, if you really want to get the air steady, you do that first and you use false fingerings for the same note. Mm -hmm. uh, Go ahead. And then you try to have them relate their tongue to where that valve change is. And so they get the same result after the tongue, see? Because it's hard to teach them how much the tongue. I always, I've tried that forever. I never could see that much success, you know? But then when I started, and, and then they keep the tone and they follow they don't follow the tonguing as much as they do the tone line. You see, they're not listening to the tonguing. They're listening to the resultant tone that's mm -hmm. on the that's on the valve, the the, uh, the false fingering valves, and then that they make sure their tongue doesn't, however, whatever tongue stroke they have, doesn't disturb that that flow because they have the flow right. You see, they have to in order to do the false fingering. And then they have to keep, they're already blowing steadily to some degree. They might not be blowing energetically enough and stuff, and we can work on that. I just give them a higher note. Usually I make them do. So I'll just have them do that. So that this way, and if you, and if you can hear tightness in their sound, well, then you go backwards. You just keep going back until you, until you can move up again, you know? And, and I think in the lessons, we show them that. So that's kind of, and double tonguing, I use the Gatala trick. The fact that Arbin was French and he never said ka, taka, taka in his life. Mm. The only word he ever said was, and I don't even think he was talking about tongue stroke as much as he was the sound of the air. See, when you, when you finish the K, that's the same sound. But if you go, uh, well, you, you're not getting anywhere. You're gonna, you're gonna eventually, you're gonna, you're gonna get lead tongue, you know, where your tongue hurts on the side. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. And, and if you get that, that means your 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 tongue too far back. See, it has to be. So you hear the air sound that comes out. That means you're making the same type of sound. If you go, ka, ka. Well, there's nothing coming out after the K. You're just getting a, a, a you know, a, 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 a dud. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. You know. Go with you. And then do it the opposite way. There you go. You do it both ways until they start getting close, you know. And uh, and I, I have all kinds of exercises in my book. I mean, I they just, they're all been, meant to, to get to change you've got to change your evil ways you know <laughs> that's what it's all about you know you, i have a question just, yeah. for all of you that that wasn't on the list uh oh um maybe you don't experience this in your studios and i'm sure if you do it to varying degrees but how do you deal with uh students today and their um lack of investing in their own equipment books value, etc yeah i know i bought uh, tons of books and mouthpieces and horns and mutes and everything and i just find today a lot of kids don't really have their own personal equipment uh and and refuse to purchase you know even their solos for their juries and things like yeah. that i think it was george earlier who mentioned how wonderful it is to have Spotify and Naxos. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of people have talked about that. And we also have imslp.org, which is free. And then I know my students have access to all these crazy shared cloud folders or things that aren't PD. 
Uh, not that I encourage my students to do that, but, but that, that those things are out there. And I think, um, in my opinion, one thing that's indicative of expecting things to be free also inclu includes maybe a lack of investment in that. I, I, I heard a, a statistic one time that something like 90% of million dollar lottery winners go bankrupt. And, and a big part of that is they did not have to earn that money. They were not invested in that money. And so they just spent it. And I think the same thing is true among music students who find the first YouTube. Uh, I think it was Jeff that said that people listen on YouTube but have no idea who it is or know nothing about the person, you know? And right. so like they, they, it's easy. Um, but you know, like they say, you get what you pay for, right? You know, so free isn't always, I had a student this year going off for grad school auditions and a uh, very fine student, but they were playing off of all, um, copied, you know, I, I was like, you know, you might want to actually like buy the music before you go off to grad school <laughs> auditions. Just, just so that is not yeah. one factor that the teacher is like, really, right. you're playing off like a stolen PDF of Onegar Entrada. Like mm -hmm. maybe you should own right. the music, you know? Yeah. Right. Um, mm -hmm. I, I own, most of you know that I have a very extensive library. It's almost all originals. Only things that I can't find do I have uh, copies of. And uh, the, the people who write these pieces make their living writing and they're getting better at it. Actually, they are getting better at it because they're taking control of their own music, which has helped them a lot. You know, they, did, they used to make nothing on, on their music. Now they're doing better. But, uh, but I think, I, think uh, I, in my syllabus, I insisted that they buy certain books. And I would buy them, actually. And then they would say, well, I'm going to send away for it. I said, no, you don't have no, to send away for it. Right I have it right here. <laughs> I've, done this, I've done the same thing for all of my freshmen. I buy the yep. books ahead of time. Yep. That way we don't have yep. to wait for the excuses. Well, I ordered it, yep. but it's not here yep. yet. Mm -hmm. yep. It's week three. Mm -hmm. No, I buy the books. It's, it's, it's a nominal cost, yeah. and, I, and I, I charge them what I get for them with the, the discounts that we get. Yeah. And so the students, right. students have it. Everybody's happy. Yeah. And really, you don't have to. And, you don't and if to it's PD, it, you know. and if it's PD, fine. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I boycotted the Charlier book for years because they charge $50. Yeah. And I didn't I, think, I, but then, what I, then they got really mad at me because I had the original Charlier book where the etudes are in a different order. Yep. And that one had a copyright quite a few years ago. So I started using it and giving it to everybody mm. because I was so angry. I mean, I paid $6 for my Charlier book mm. yeah, and people are paying $58 for their Charlier book. I think that's yeah. ridiculous. You know, it's the same book, it, the same book. So, so basically, uh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of on both sides of the fence here, but at the same time, every student needs to have a library. Mm -hmm. And that includes easier music and more challenging music. <laughs> yeah. And the reason when I went to UK, I didn't have any easy music. I had all music that nobody could play. Yeah. It was depressing. I'm going, oh my God. <laughs> I, I, I've got all this music. And I had a lot of music, but yeah. I didn't have a uh, handle Aria con Variazioni. And I love it. I played it when I was in college. My teacher, you know, I have what it. I, that was one get, of the ones I had. Yeah. What I get tired of is that, you know, I'm, I own like five copies of the Hindemith and 10 copies of the Haydn. No, you piano, no trumpet parts. You get, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, and so I stopped, I stopped doing that and I scanned my entire solo library. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, the student, but whether, you know, I'm compassionate. Not everybody can afford these solos. They're too much money. And uh, yeah. so, you know, you use them for educational purposes only. And that's the loophole in the law is that as long as you use your materials that you copy for educational purposes only, you, you can get away with certain copyright with, with letting the students use the solo. I try to make it a precedence that for the recitals, at least they should own their own material for the recitals. Yeah. yeah. And other than that, you know, we try to do the best we can. You want to encourage them to buy their own things, but unfortunately, not every student can. Yeah, yeah but, but on the library right. committee. No, I hear on that. The library committee. I, I hear that, but I, okay, so I didn't have any money growing up, you know, so I was still able to amass my collection of, of resources, and they're still not as extensive as others. Right. 
But what I find interesting is that students will show up to my lessons with brand new Jordans on. Ooh, wow. A brand and new Starbucks, Starbucks coffee. And, <laughs> right. But they don't own yeah. a, a, a sheet of paper or. Mm. <laughs> No, right. I think I think this is another casualty of a digital age, though. They're mm -hmm. so used to getting everything. If they can't find it mm -hmm. online that they can download, it's just like a, a point. It's like what's the the, the um, quote from the office? Like endless paper in a paperless world. I think mm -hmm. they, you know, they don't they don't see. You know, if they can't find it, then it's hard to find it. What I usually do with solos is I'll give them a PDF of the solo, but when it comes down to it, they've got to buy. For the piano part, yeah. <laughs> but because you know, I'm not going to give them the piano part. They've got to, they've got to get that on their own. And you know, if they're resourceful enough, they'll find right. it. Either. Right. And I and I say this too. Um, most of our students at some point are going to be taking these general education classes. And if you've ever priced a chemistry book, a biology book, yep. the price eight. of one of those books is eight trumpet books at least. Mm -hmm. you yes. Know, because I've priced them. And so, if you can if you can pay 150 book bucks for a for a chemistry book that you're not going to use after the semester, yes. you, you need to buy the um, <laughs> the resources. So, I mean, I have in my syllabus there's like a you get two to three weeks. So I take I think of that as a pay period. If yeah. you can if you you know if you have a job or you need to scrape up the money, you know two to three weeks and go without that Starbucks latte, you know for, for a week. <laughs> that's that's about thirty dollars right there. You can get an Arvin book, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. maybe even a Clark. Get so, an Arvin book for free. You can get uh, I MSLP, yeah, Clark yeah. and Arvin. You know, and, yeah. you know, I just I just think that it's priorities. You know, yeah. you got to remember. We do have to remember that not to make an excuse for them, mm -hmm. but in high school, most of them played off. You know, like eight minutes of marching band music for the whole school. Yep, and then they played three concert band pieces. And then they had the all state music and they get that for free. It's just something. And then they might play a thing for solo and ensembles and they might buy that. So yeah. they're just not used to buying any music. It, and I did, like I say, my syllabus, they had to buy every book. Mm -hmm. Otherwise that they were done. They, you know, I said, you, you gotta have the books because when they get out, they're going to need the books to teach if they were going to do anything in music. You right. know, they, they, they gotta have the books. I mean, in two years, I can buy all mine. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think uh, we've been going about two hours strong, guys. Right. Yeah. I think it's I'm probably it's our time to... Um, I'm going to bed. That's what I like to do, too. So thanks to all my good friends for giving up two hours of your evening. It's been such a pleasure to speak with all of you. I think yeah. maybe a good way to close is just to go around the room and let everyone out there who's watching... I see we don't have a lot of questions on the Facebook feed, but we do have things like people asking for Vince DiMartino's syllabus um, and, and stuff like that. So you can send it to him. It's fine. Great. Uh, so maybe we can just kind of go around and just share the best way to get in touch with you. I see Jeff's got his email address there as his name. So just yeah. pretty easy there. Uh, but um, I'll, I'll, uh, how do we get in touch with you, Eric? Uh, eSwisher at murraystate.edu. Uh, Vince DiMartino, it's uh, D-I-M-A-R-T-V at gmail.com. Greg? Google Greg Wing. I'm the first wing that comes up. <laughs> and, uh, all, all my contact information will be right there. Thank you. <laughs> hey, Stacy, how do we get in touch with you? Yes, I have a website, stacysimpson.com. Easy enough. S T A C Y, no E, please. <laughs> right. right on. Hey, Van Fleet, how do we get in touch with you? Yeah, my email address is josephvanfleet at yahoo.com, or you can uh, look me up uh, at uh, the EKU Music School website. Great. Marlon, how do we get in touch with you? Uh, Marlon McKay Music at gmail.com. Or you can add me as a friend on Facebook, and I'm pretty good about responding to messages. Great. Sarah? Yeah, um, right now while I'm in transition, probably finding me on Facebook and uh, um, doing a private message, or my Gmail account is seherber at gmail.com. So no, no T. G. No T. That's right. 
All right. <laughs> Reese? Reese.land at louisville.edu. And George? Uh, Carpton, C A R P T E N G one at nku. dot edu. I'll uh, I'll show you Tom Stevens' uh, card that he used to give to people. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, <wait. laughs> that would that would be wow. appropriate. That's true. Wow. That's absolutely true. It said Tom Stevens, yeah. go away. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Jeff, did I steal your thunder? Do you have a, is the Asbury email a good way for them to contact you? That's a good way. Yeah. Or Facebook messenger as well. But yeah, there's my email address. <laughs> Great. And to reach out to me, Facebook is fine. Or you can find my phone and email on the University of Kentucky School of Music website. So thanks friends for doing this. I had such a great time. Uh, best to all of you up. in this uh, quarantine period and hope to see you all in person soon. We'll have to have an in-person get together when the quarantine is Absolutely. over. Hey, thanks, thanks, to, thanks, to all, thanks to all the Thank you all. trumpet teachers you all. for being yeah. one of the greatest trumpet faculties in any state for sure. Hey, well, we got a we got a good clan, that's for sure. Thanks, Vince and Greg. Yep. Oh, you Love guys. Love y'all. See you, you later. See you guys later. Bye, Bye guys. Bye. Oh, have popcorn. Bye. Yeah. <laughs> I'm too tired and old. <laughs>